All right, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. For those of you that do not have copies of the syllabus, they will be available here at the front. You may shuffle up and get them. I think I passed out several to the rear. Also, this is also a notice that this course is being recorded and will be available following every lecture within 48 hours on our website, um, and you will be able to access it there. Following class, I will remain here at the front of Fisher Lecture Hall. For those that are not currently enrolled in this course but wish to transfer in, you may speak with me at that time. Those wishing to disenroll following this lecture series are welcome to speak with the registrar. Um, focusing on the course today, I'll give you a quick overview before we get into lecture one, the background and history of Yugoslavia. This course will predominantly focus on the course, causes, and effects of the 1986 European War and how the repercussions of that conflict can be seen today in modern Europe. Your evaluation process will be based around four essay papers sourced in primary source documents that will be provided with you as part of your weekly readings. This is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday course. For those of you that have not read the syllabus, we'll be meeting here in Fisher every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 4 p.m. Absence policy and everything else you need to read are in the syllabus, which I strongly recommend all of you pick up. Alrighty then. With that out of the way, we'll be moving on to the first lecture in this series, focusing on Yugoslavia, the core of the 1986 European War. Yugoslavia is, or was, a country in the Balkan region of southeastern Europe, uh, predominantly formed uh, through the national identity of Pan-Slavism. Pan-Slavism was the unified idea of Slavs seeking a national singular identity uh, that came to prominence in the late 18 and early 1900s. Uh, this is an ideology that also was influential in the First World War, um, which will be seen through items like the Black Hand and Serbian nationalism, which then grew into Pan-Slavism. Uh, but the nation of Yugoslavia itself was founded following World War II um, and was led by resistance fighter and then turned president Bratz Tito. He worked with various allied groups during the war, both associated with the UK and the United States, as well as with the USSR, and had various political ideologies during that period that were difficult to define. Um, other nationalities and resistance groups within Yugoslavia, or what would become Yugoslavia, worked in collaboration with the Germans and Italians for various reasons. Uh, some only worked with the Soviet Union, some only worked with uh, the West, the United Kingdom, and Great Britain. Um, and the United States, while others, like Tito's predominantly powerful partisans, worked with both sides. Uh, the country was founded following the end of the Second World War and was the only major territory that was not liberated by the Red Army, but instead liberated itself from Nazi occupation. Uh, in, the po in the Cold War period, Yugoslavia under Tito was regarded by most in the West as a communist state. It had a centralized planned economy that was focused around the ideals of socialism, but did not fall into the direct sphere of influence of Moscow, and instead was one of the leading identitarian groups of the non-aligned movement. They were not a member of NATO, they were not a member of the Warsaw Pact, and while other European leaders in Eastern Europe came to heel underneath Stalin, Tito remained a strong, independent leader, despite hovering close to the Soviet camp, and also survived several Soviet assassination attempts in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, there is uh, a bit of an anecdote regarding uh, some interactions between Tito and Stalin, where Tito remarked uh, that Stalin needed to stop sending his assassins and spies, as they would only be sent back to the Soviet Union in a body bag, and then Tito also equipped that he would need to only send one of his assassins to take care of Stalin. After that, it seems that the two leaders, whether or not that anecdote is true, focused on building relations and socialism in southeastern Europe, as opposed to conflicting with one another. Uh, the non-aligned movement, as I was discussing, it was focused around Yugoslavia, was founded in 1961 in Belgrade, the capital of the country at that time, and involved such countries as Afghanistan, Cuba, India, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, as a non-aligned country, the Yugoslavs were able to pander both to the west and the east, depending upon how the flows of political and military uh, needs dictated at the time, and also aggressively marketed themselves to the West as a place for business opportunities, for places for industrialization to take place, and also for tourism along the Adriatic coast. Um, there were several advertisements focused on the tropic beauty of the region, which is still very much a highly active tourist location today, but is predominantly controlled by the nation-state of Croatia. Uh, Bratz Tito died of a brain hemorrhage in May 1980, 
uh, and the state attempted to hide his death for approximately a week as it assembled major leaders of the country uh, to uh, resolve this crisis. Tito had remained uh, effectively a dictator over the country for his entire period and was highly successful at crushing um, any sort of factionalism that broke out in Yugoslavia. Since this was made up of multiple different national ethnic groups, including Catholic Croats, Orthodox Serbs, Montenegrins, Slovenes, Macedonians, Muslim Albanians, and Bosniaks, the central government was responsible for keeping long-standing ethnic tensions uh, between these individual groups tamped down, absolutely crushed and maintained at an absolute bare minimum to maintain the cohesiveness of the unified Slavic state. Um, these two group or these uh, multitudes of groups had started to come into conflict late in Tito's reign, but he had consistently utilizing both the national military and also a broad-based security and state police apparatus were able to keep them under control. Now, Soviet politics in this period were undergoing a substantive change. Uh, Yuri Andropov led the Soviet Union from November 1982 to February 1984. He died uh, in February, and this was also a period that was highly defined by rapid turnover of aging Soviet leaders. In February of 84, he was replaced by Konstantin Chernyenko, who made it just about a year, dropping dead in March 1985. In the Soviet Union, there became a great debate over the future of both the party and the country, as no leader that had led the country since uh, Lenin was not a veteran of the Great Patriotic War, or World War II, um, in the Soviet Union. And when we are still looking at that pool of veterans and that pool of, uh, of party leaders, we're dealing with people who are only lasting now a year, two years in power due to their age they're getting on. So if they were in their 20s during the Great Patriotic War in 1944 and 45, by 1984 and 1985, these people are going to be in their 60s, late or early 70s at minimum, moving towards Soviet leadership. And we're not really seeing a lot of longevity with somebody of that age. The party has a great and substantive internal debate, but eventually the party apparatus goes with hardliner Grigory Romanov um, to take over the party uh, after he defeats uh, the agriculture minister and kind of a lesser known figure named Gorbachev. Um, after Romanov receives the backing of the stalwart kingmaker uh, and intelligence chief Andrei Gromyko. Uh, under Romanov, the Soviet Union moved into a period of uh, especially hard societal crackdowns against Western influences. While neither Andropov nor Chernyenko were uh, major reformers, mostly due to their age, lack of energy, and short time in power, the period of Romanov is especially defined by crackdowns against Western influences, things that had started to enter the country, such as jeans and uh, Western music and dance, were heavily suppressed. Uh, criminal prosecutions and proceedings by the police against youths and other people partaking in uh, what was originally just thought of as social indiscretions or counterculture activity uh, was heavily frowned upon. And we also call this period uh, one of de-snickerization. Snickerization had begun um, in the Soviet Union in 1970, coined after the Snickers bar, where Western items like the Snickers bar became very popular and could often be used as a form of ersatz currency on the black market. But under Romanov, we undergo de-snickerization, where it is far more dangerous to be caught with something like a Snickers bar or a Hershey chocolate bar, uh, products of the West that were taken into the country and were being sold and moved around illegally, uh, than any sort of worth that they would have in simply consuming and enjoying them. Um, after the first year of Romanov's reign, we see the trials of the 100, uh, where exactly 100 military, government, and civilian officials uh, were arrested on various charges, mostly focused around incompetence and corruption, and were publicly executed across the Soviet Union in July of 1985. Uh, this marked a major turning point in Soviet public opinion um, towards Romanov, and also uh, saw a deep strengthening of the party base and a suppression of nearly all uh, party dissent, both from within and without. Uh, within the party, there was talk uh, that we now see through the declassified and um, opened up former Soviet archives that many of these people were in fact incompetent and corrupt. Some of them were simply arrested on trumped-up charges due to their opposition to the Chernyenko regime. But this purge had two points. One, to remove incompetence from the party, and also to show that Romanov uh, was focused for the people 
to restoring the functional value of the party, to restoring competence so that people could have faith in the centralized Soviet party uh, and believe that it was acting in their best interests and would not permit uh, government abuses of the people or of the systems in place without severe and harsh uh, reprisals. The trials of the 100 were largely show trials, um, the likes of which the Soviet Union really had not seen uh, since the 1930s, but uh, we, we do definitely see a period of retrenchment within both the military and the social elements of the Soviet Union backing the government either out of fear or renewed appreciation for the government's focus on uh, maintaining authority, fairness, and equality uh, such as it was under the Soviet system. Romanov had also instituted a troop surge into Afghanistan uh, as a short-term plan to end the war there and to prop up uh, the deeply unstable Afghan socialist government. So we have Soviet troops heavily invested in Afghanistan, uh, division upon division was being poured in in an attempt to crush overwhelmingly once and for all uh, the Mujahideen and various rebel factions in the country, and a uh, hardline move at home in the Soviet Union under Romanov. So with that in mind, we now return to Yugoslavia and uh, the death of Tito. Romanov, seeing this along uh, with the West, is looking at um, a situation that is difficult to immediately interpret, what will happen following the death of Tito. One of the first things, though, that we see is a stark rise in Serbian nationalism uh, that had not been present um, in, in forthright and open ways during Tito's reign. Now, Yugoslavia, as it had originally functioned on paper anyway, was a functional republic um, with socialism at its core, but a great deal of voting through the unified uh, socialist party. Uh, to, an attempt to maintain uh, harmony and ethnic uh, uh, suppression of the ethnic tensions in the state at the time, we see that the presidency, instead of residing in a single new dictator, actually rotates every year through the national or the major national groups of the country. Uh, Tito had been very successful at suppressing each of the national groups in turn through what a policy that he had called brotherhood and unity, where regardless of faction, whether even you were of Tito's ethnicity, uh, if you attempted to support just a single ethnic group and uh, assault others, Tito's party and Tito's military were very effective at suppressing that. But as the presidency rotates every year through the various national groups in a uh, difficult attempt to maintain balance, control, we see a breakdown in uh, the authority of the state and the capacity of the state under this kind of revolving door of leaders to take cohesive action and enact long-term policy objectives. Uh, and this breakdown really starts to solidify as we see it in December of 1985. Um, Radovan Vladik, a name I have probably butchered, as well as Sinan Hassani, uh, we see them as the uh, series of presidents uh, that are in line. The next president, as I mentioned, Sinan, um, set up for the country in 1985, was supposed to take over from uh, Lakovic and demanded that Kosovo, uh, their to smaller republic that didn't actually have full uh, status, it was more of a semi-autonomous region, uh, Hassani demanded that Kosovo uh, gain full rights as a republic or they would withdraw uh, from the Union entirely as uh, his presidency was about to take place. Now, looking to the JNA or the Yugoslav National Army is critical at this stage in December 1985. Up to this point, we had not seen any major uh, problems with uh, security and safety within uh, the Yugoslav state in the five years between Tito's death in 1980 uh, and this crisis developing in 1985 with Hassani. But um, the Yugoslav National Army was made up predominantly of Serbs. Uh, Serbs made up approximately one-third of the Yugoslav population um, based on, simply off of their ethnicity and the capacity of the Serbian National Unity Group uh, to maintain population. Uh, since earlier times, Serbs had always been quite dominant in the affairs of uh, southeastern Europe, southwestern Europe, should I say, and uh, the the region of the Balkans in general. Um, but we also have a large minority of Croats within the National Army, and then proportions and fractions thereof splintering out into the smaller groups. Um, but around this period in 1985, we started to see each republic beginning to assert greater control against the government in Belgrade, 
and a clear impotency having developed over the last five years of a revolving door of presidents and people no longer wanting to have authority held there in a, in a government that only was going to be in power for a year as opposed to national li leadership. And when I say national, we're talking about the national ethnic groups, not the supranational organization that was Yugoslavia. Um, and border clashes actually are starting to begin between national militia groups, what were also called the territorial defense units. These were a reserve of the Yugoslav National Army. Um, and since mandatory conscription, each national um, organization, and again, national organization meaning uh, what would develop into Croatia or the Croat National Area, the Serbian National Area, which would develop into Serbia uh, following the European War, had their own territorial defense units that acted um, similar to the American uh, National Guard or State National Guard um, that were um, uh, former soldiers and officers of the core JNA or Yugoslav National Army. And border clashes between these groups are beginning. Around 1985, we start to get reports of ethnic cleansing, uh, starting off as non-lethal ethnic cleansing, which was simply the forced removal um, of national rivals from enclave areas within um, different territories, especially this was common uh, in the very early days, Muslims being removed from areas uh, that were predominantly of uh, Serbian nationality or Serbian national identity. They were not initially being removed with uh, lethal violence. They were being removed with violence. This was not a voluntary uh, experience by any means. Ethnic cleansing is never something uh, that is voluntary or kind. But we don't start to see lethal ethnic cleansing until several months later, really in... Um, in bulk, when the structure of the JNA starts to completely break down um, as we start to enter 1986. Now, in 1983, which is the last major pieces of data we have on the JNA, uh, we're looking at approximately 150,000 active duty soldiers in the military covering the Army, uh, Navy, and Air Force, uh, with 90,000 of those being conscripts and an, an, at least a million uh, fully trained reservists, which were designed to be mobilized in wartime and were occasionally called up in batches to partake in war games, military exercises, and retraining that would be necessary for this national uh, reservist nature. The Yugoslav army was very geared around uh, a uh, idea of defense. It was not really built um, ever as an offensive force to go after any of its regional uh, neighbors, mostly because those neighbors were all members of larger organizations, be they NATO or the Warsaw Pact. Um, but the JNA was a very effective and very well-trained, um, and I would say uh, on par with the region, if not more powerful than their individual neighbors, um, as a defensive force. And the territorial uh, reserves, which were made up, as I mentioned, of former conscripts, um, were also focused around their national areas, and that becomes to be uh, very important during this time. Now, military uh, service was compulsory in Yugoslavia, so nearly every male citizen had experience as being part of the JNA, and there was a clear bond between the people and the national army, and an identity of that army truly being representative of a supranational body, the entire Yugoslav state, and not an individual portion of it. Uh, that perception will also begin to change in this period. Uh, as the wars begin, um, which is the, what we would call the pre-war period, just the Yugoslav disturbances, uh, problems mostly began between Macedonia and the Macedonians and portions of Kosovo, which would lead to exchanges of gunfire uh, between militia groups um, and were really uh, lightly armed and armored elements of those respective areas, uh, national defense forces clashing with one another while the development, uh, the more and more impotent government in Belgrade ordered both the Air Force and the core active frontline JNA to intervene uh, to these kinds of clashes, which the JNA consistently declined to do. Both uh, the high command of the JNA was incapable of uh, really ordering these kinds of retaliatory and uh, suppressive efforts. They were mostly interested in not forcing members of the JNA who were of nationalities involved in this fighting to go against their brethren, and were hoping that really allowing this ethnic cleansing to take place could potentially allow the JNA to survive, allow Yugoslavia to survive, uh, and move forward as a damaged but still collectively unified uh, country. But this was really a final line when we're seeing, and the rest of the country was seeing, 
the JNA refusing to act against pretty substantive clashes of forces. We're talking about maybe a thousand uh, individuals would be fighting um, in the larger of, uh, larger pieces of these clashes with light armor and armored personnel carriers. Not really tanks and artillery at this point, but we're still seeing uh, pretty substantive firefights that would break out um, when cleansing was taking place or over uh, blockaded roads and the like. Uh, and this is a final line where the army is clearly seen uh, to be responsible for standing up and preventing ethnic conflicts, but they were, are no longer capable of that, and the authority of the army in Belgrade quickly breaks down. Things develop pretty quickly after this, and it becomes clear that the army and air force are not going to be active parties in stopping national fighting and assertions of power. Uh, and the first major um, outbreak of cohesive national focused violence to break away is when a group of uh, zealotous Croatian Catholics stormed the League of Communist Office in Zagreb, uh, the capital of now Croatia, and uh, brutally slaughtered the inhabitants of the building, lining many up in the offices, shooting them in cold blood, men uh, and women regardless of their national origin, simply as being communists who had suppressed the Catholic identity for very long. Um, which then turned into approximately 48 hours of rioting and militia clashes that took place across Croatia. Uh, certain elements of the army attempted to stop this uh, without direct orders from the capital. Elements of the Air Force uh, launched sorties, um, but rogue AA batteries, and uh, there are also reports that um, aircraft that came under the control of Croats took off, there were clashes, and we now begin to enter a period of almost civil war uh, between different elements and national groups within Yugoslavia and uh, the Yugoslav central state, but also between separate national groups. Um, both NATO and the Warsaw Pact had been engaged in secret negotiations at this period with various actors throughout the country, um, and during the Christmas season of 1985, we're discussing uh, options for outright independence and forming coalitions for republics on both or either side of the conflict to separate from Yugoslavia, break up that supranational bloc, and enter either the Warsaw Pact or NATO as individual nation states. Uh, and these negotiations really began to add prestige by for uh, separate national leaders by allowing them to engage directly uh, with superpowers, be they the Soviet Union or be they the United States. Uh, when you are somebody uh, like uh, a Slobodan Milosevic who would eventually rise to power um, in the Serbian leadership and you have the opportunity to be negotiating directly with Romanov in Moscow, uh, you're definitely being seen as somebody who has authority and real international respect and recognition. Um, and that is also where we begin to see the flow of arms and the flow of direct supplies for different national groups um, as they seek to develop uh, their individual identity within a growingly multifaceted and multi-sided civil war. Um, as it becomes clear that many of these national groups are not going to be able, uh, without extensive fighting, to separate themselves from Yugoslavia, and as it becomes clear that people like uh, Milosevic may be attempting to play both sides against the middle, so play the Warsaw Pact and NATO off against each other. Uh, Romanov ordered uh, Warsaw Pact forces to cross the borders of Yugoslavia in the major, first major national uh, international escalation of uh, the Yugoslav crisis that developed into the European war when he ordered troops across the frontier in March, uh, early March, I believe it was the 3rd. Um, hold on, let's... Yes, March 3rd of uh, 86. After calling a halt to his Afghan surge um, late in February and attempting to order troops across the border there to return promptly, um, we see a large variety of veteran combat units, mostly though without their heavy equipment that was being left behind in the Central Asian states due to uh, inability of the Soviet infrastructure to bring it directly to Yugoslavia. We see large quantities of light infantry, truck-mounted infantry, and motorized groups enter Yugoslavia. Um, under a speech that Romanov gives that is uh, especially iconic for coining the phrase um, to pacify the nation and to make it safe once more for socialism. Um, it is unclear, uh, especially at this early stage, whether or not Romanov is attempting to uh, allow Yugoslavia to break up and then to absorb the whole into the Warsaw Pact, or this is an attempt to restore supranational identity to Yugoslavia 
uh, and bringing them into the Warsaw Pact. But regardless, forces in uh, London, in Bonn, in West Germany, and in uh, especially in Washington see this as a major escalation of the crisis and draws an immediate reaction from NATO, who begin to deploy forces from Italy into Croatia. Um, there's a early NATO press release that says that those forces would be attempting to, quote, restore order and render assistance to a failed state. Um, so we see now the West Australia has really broken off any negotiations with remaining elements of the Yugoslav state. They have been declared failed by both the West and the East in various ways. Um, and as forces in early March begin to speed into the disintegrating uh, uh, body of Yugoslavia, we see national or army units, uh, territorial defense units, either allowing this in some cases, joining with either War pa uh, Warsaw Pact or NATO forces, or attempting to oppose them at the borders and being promptly crushed uh, without the unified support of the entire Yugoslav body. Um, but that is going to actually take us to the end of today's discussion. Um, I would highly recommend that you use the extra, I believe it is five minutes, that you'll be receiving off of the end of today's lecture to, again, refamiliarize yourself with the syllabus. Um, and any questions can be directed to myself. As I said, I'll be at the front here of Fisher uh, for the end of today. And those listening to disenroll from this course will need to see uh, the registrar within the next four days. I strongly recommend you remain, though. We will be continuing to focus on the 1986 European War uh, and its repercussions that we see into modern Europe today. So those of you that are focused uh, on the development of modern Europe uh, and the end of the Cold War will be especially interested uh, in this lecture. Naturally, this is simply part one of our lecture series for EUR 4421. I look forward to seeing all of you back here next week as we begin to examine uh, the early phases of conflict in Yugoslavia and the direct confrontations that occurred uh, between NATO forces and the early engagements with Warsaw Pact and their allied Yugoslav friends.